Very good. Uh, so turn to someone next to you and have a little discussion. Who is the saver in your home and who is the spender in your home? That's question number one. And question number two is, have you ever had any, I don't know, emotional discussions about money in your home, okay? This should be particularly interesting with couples. So, <laughs> I'm open for therapy afterwards. I'm charged. I'm kidding, I don't try to Go ahead, discuss this for like two minutes. Time. Who's the spender? Raise your hand. Who's the spender in the household? Okay. <laughs> Uh, another statistic. 
Of those who made $75,000 or more, I think this is per individual earner. That's a lot of money, by the way, right? Um, only 1% of those people who had over $75,000 or more gave 10% of their income. In other words, the more money you make, the richer you are, the less you give. That's another interesting statistic. Another one he said, 96, and this is a good one, right? 96% of practicing Christians are givers. They give to church and nonprofit, and that's awesome news. Now, again, the amount is 2.5% of everything. But they do give. Let's talk about generations. Gen X, my age, which is, uh, I mean, I gotta look it up, 1965 to 1980, those be born between those times, 19% of those people are donors, uh, whereas, and, and they represent 26.6% of the population. Whereas Gen Y, right, are millennials, those between, born between 1980 and 1997, are, represent 7% of all donors, even though they represent a higher number. Now, this kind of makes sense to a degree because they're just getting into the workforce, they don't have as much to give, but um, in terms of actual, um, th this is an amount, this is whether people are giving, it's really low. And the last one is a sad one to me, the amount of giving to religious institutions has gone down by 50% since 1990. That is amazing. Um, let me brag on our church, however. These are American statistics for the American church as a whole, but for our church, our amount of giving since, oh boy, since 1990, I don't know since 1990, but since I started pastoring this church in 2007, what, seven? 2007, has gone up by fourfold. I would say three and a half fold. Okay? That's is that three hundred percent, three hundred fifty percent, whatever. So congratulations to us, um, and that's good. But it's it shouldn't exempt us from still learning about what God has to say about money, uh, because Jesus addresses the topic of money uh, more in the Gospels than you might imagine. In fact, there are thirty eight parables that Jesus. Shows or, or, or uh, shares and state and says, out of the 38, 16 of them are around 30 percent address money, wealth, and giving. So naturally, when we turn back to the Sermon on the Mount, we're in part five of the Sermon on the Mount. We find that Jesus does address giving. We're back in Matthew um, chapter six and turn to verse 19. So I want to do this a little bit differently than we have before, and I want you to read it with your partner, okay, with somebody next to you. Just go ahead and read that whole passage together out loud, 19 through 34. It's going to take you about three or four minutes. Go ahead. about an eye. 
The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is healthy, the whole body is going to be full of light. If the eye is bad, the whole body will be full of darkness. And it's like, what? Did any of you notice that? And then he goes back to talking about uh, no one can serve two masters and then money. So is Jesus simply unable to like keep track of a single topic? Is he like bouncing around? And of course the answer is no. Jesus is the master storyteller. He knows exactly what he's trying to say. So what is it about this detour of light in the eye and everything that has to do with money? Um, what it means is this. Think about what he's saying. The light, right, comes into your body through the eye. And when your eye takes in light, you're able to navigate the world, right? You're able to step down because you know there's a step there. You know that you shouldn't walk this way because you'll knock yourself into a pew. If you don't have a working eye, chances are you're not going to be able to navigate the world without stumbling, right? And so it is also, right, with our money. When it comes to money, it's easy to become blind to its purpose. We forget, right, we're not able to see clearly on how our lives are supposed to interact with the created things. It's easy for us to become dependent on money and material things when we are blinded to it. And materialism and greed and money then can have a power over us and how we see everything. How we see everything, right? And you know this because you know people that are so focused on money that they're just so obsessed with more, more, they need it for different people. We'll talk about reasons for that in a moment. So let me give you an example, all right? The first example is this. Money has a way of going ninja on you. It has stealth properties. Money is able to hide itself from you. A materialism and greed, I should say. In other words, uh, right, the, the statistics show us that people give less money the more that they have. But if you were to ask people if they struggle with greed, if you were to ask people if they struggle with giving, they would say, absolutely not. I don't have a problem with greed. I don't have a problem. You know, nobody thinks that they have a problem with greed. Nobody thinks they're rich. I mean, a few people know they're rich. They're the ones who, who are the billionaires who sign, uh, you know, who's the Microsoft guy, right? He, he's got some kind of billion, billionaire's pledge to give away 50% of your wealth. Those guys know they're rich, but the rest of us don't think we're rich. We don't think we're rich. We think we're, we're poor most of the time. We come with a deficit mindset, thinking that we don't have enough. That's typically where we stand in life when it comes to money. We typically think we don't have enough. And greed darkens the eye. We, greed blinds us to the reality of what we have and don't have. If you look at Luke 12, uh, if you look at Luke 12, we see that a young man comes to Jesus and he pleads. He says this, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus replies with this. He says, uh, friend, watch out. Uh, watch out and be on guard against all greed. Because one's life is not in the abundance of his possessions. So why does Jesus have to warn us about greed? Isn't that interesting? Think about this for a second. There are a lot of other sins that we don't need to be warned about that we're fully aware of. A warning means, hey, look, something's out there and you're probably not aware of it. Okay? But if you're having, doing adultery, if you're like cheating on your wife, you know that you're cheating on your wife. You don't like all of a sudden wake up and we'll, we'll be like, oh, whoa, wait, you're not my wife. Right? You know that you're cheating. If you're lying to somebody, you're not like, oh, yeah, I know that I'm telling you the truth. No, you know that you're lying to somebody. You might be trying to justify it. You might say, well, I am lying, but there's a good reason for why I'm lying. But you know that you're lying. But Jesus says that for you need to be warned about greed. You need to be told that this, and why is it that you need to be warned about greed? Because we are blind to our own greed. We are blind to our own materials, and we don't even see it in ourselves. And so it has this stealth ninja property that <laughs> materialism is able to hide itself from you. Um, I've been
been a pastor now for going on 12 years now. And over the years, there's been a number of times when people come up to me and ask for prayer. Because they're struggling with something. You know, they're struggling with maybe a personal sin that they're going through, maybe some uh, sickness they're going through, or a challenge in their relationship with their spouse or whatever, the kids. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm always praying for people for things like this. But never, never in the history of me being a pastor has anyone come up to me and said, Pastor, can you pray for me? I really struggle with greed. I really struggle with feeling like I have too much money. Like, no one's ever done that to me. <laughs> right? No one. Why? Because no one thinks they're greedy. Okay, so we've hammered this point home pretty hard. Right? It's, it's not so obvious of a sin to us that we're greedy because no one thinks that they are. So why, think about this, why do people, and here's where it affects everybody, we're so blind to it, but it affects everybody. You know people who go after jobs and pursue jobs and they may not even be good at the job and they may not like the job, they probably hate the job, <laughs> right? But guess what? It pays well. What do they call that? They call it the golden handcuffs. I heard that for the first time. I'm like, whoa, what does that mean? It means, <laughs> like, right, you're bound to the job because it pays so well, but you hate it, right? But at least you can do it. The golden handcuffs. Why do, why do people stick in those jobs? It doesn't, they're not good at it, it may not help anybody, but it makes the money. Why is that? Because their eyes are dark. They're darkened, they're blinded. It. How about companies? They come into small towns. You've heard about these big mega, mega companies. They come and they screw up the town economy. They screw up the town's environment, right? They're dumping waste in the rivers. We have rivers in America that are toxic. You can't fish out of them. They eat the fish. Why? Because companies don't say, hey, let's care about these people. Let's care about the, their environment. And it, let's, you know, the, Let's care about people instead of the bottom line. Companies don't do that. They just care, like many of them, care about their bottom line. Now, obviously not all companies and not all people. But the fact is, is that the bottom line is king. Uh, why don't they want to do that? Because their eyes are darkened. You know, there's thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people that work for these companies. And they know, but they don't know because they're not asking the questions. Is my company actually healthy for this or not? helping people. Maybe not, but they prefer to be blind to it because I can't lose my paycheck. How about, um, right, these uh, companies, organizations, they spin stories and narratives because their eyes have been darkened by grief. And of course, you're hanging out about you. Let's, let's, you know, let's not talk about those people. Let's talk about us, right? You all have that rich relative. You got a rich sister, you got a rich cousin or whatever, right? And you know, that's all it takes. Oh my gosh, you can't call me greedy because look at them. Look how much they're spending. Look at what they're driving. You can't, I don't feel greedy because I'm not like them. And we exempt ourselves from thinking that we have a problem because we're not as rich as the person next to us. Now I had this happen to me personally. Last week was Zethan's birthday party. Y'all know where I live. I live in Plymouth, right on the edge of really, really rich people. So Zephyr's classmates, right? One of his classmates, um, uh, there, uh, it's a couple, uh, like one of his classmates, Vivi, her, her mom and dad are on the back of buses and on signs, you know, the real estate moguls. And uh, I'm like, we went to the zoo uh, a couple weeks ago. And there they are, and I was like, I think I recognize those people. Those people are, are on all these billboards. Uh, all over the place. But at, at his party, he had invited some of his friends from school, and all, like half of the people that were, the parents were dropping off their kids for my son's birthday party, were driving, you know, the BMW SUVs, these $60,000, $70,000 SUVs. They caught wealth, and I sat there thinking to myself, I don't make enough. Now listen, do I make enough? Yeah, I'm fine. I have never had a day in my life, right, where I've truly starved or been hungry. I have never really, you know, been an inability to get where I needed to, to go. I, I have never felt poverty, and here I am thinking to myself, I don't, I don't earn enough. And that is the darkness, the, the dark eye that greed has on our lives. So, uh, greed puts us in a... Um, 
has this power over us, and the how of how, how I have powers over us is it puts us in a deficit mindset. I don't have enough. I need more. And that mindset has a way of mastering you, doesn't it? He's like, let me get out of this. I can't, I can't, I, you know, I gotta get out of this. So, that's the how. The second question is why? Why does money have this power over us? Why? Uh, and we find this, in, this powerful verse in verse 21. So this will be a little shorter. Where your treasure is, look at this, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It's a very famous verse. We've all heard this before. And what Jesus means by this is this. That the place where your heart really rests, the place where your heart really rests is revealed by where you spend money. Okay? One of the reasons we spend so much money, like one reason, is that we're looking for uh, significance. Right? A lot of times we're like, I can buy significance. I can buy uh, people looking at me and saying that I'm worth something. It shows that we're able to live in certain neighborhoods. It shows that we're able to drive certain kinds of cars. It shows that we can eat in the restaurants that we want to eat in. Money shows us uh, and shows other people, right? And you don't even have to be like this conspicuous consumption or where, consumption where you're buying the biggest and the greatest and the most expensive. But uh, by all means, many of us get into debt, getting into something more expensive than what we can afford. Why? Because we want to look significant. It could even talk, be to our own parents, like where our parents really pushed us, right? I come from a Chinese family, and <laughs> again, that joke goes, goes a long way. Uh, but, uh, okay, in my, uh, my sister lives in Vancouver, and I remember going and visiting her, and we went down and we're like, where do you all the Chinese? Because Vancouver is like 40% Chinese, but a lot of uh, places in, in Vancouver are like dominantly Chinese. And, and we were in a place called uh, Richmond, I think it's called Richmond, uh, a, a neighborhood in Vancouver. And the joke is, is that the reason why so many Chinese live in Richmond is because it has the word rich in it. Uh, and it's true, a, there is a Chinese mall there, and at the bottom level of this mall, and they have like these fountains that look like it should be in, in Vegas, right? And on the bottom level, there was a, a like this ultra sports car, um, dealership where they had the, the Lamborghini and the whatever those the cars are. I mean, it was crazy, like just right in there in the mall, uh, Richmond. But significance, we're looking for significance in our lives. Um, the higher income you get, and here's the thing, sobering thought, the higher income you get, you don't, you no longer just look at people below you and say, they're economically below me. You start to say, they're just below me, right? And you know people who are rich, and you're like, oh, I think they think that way of me. And that's the sad thing, is that we find ourselves in that same struggle, that we find ourselves making more and more, more money, and we find ourselves looking at others and saying, they're not just economically below me, they're actually below me. We see blindness, we're darkened in our eyes, we don't see clearly the more that we have. Middle class people even feel superior to the poor. Not all, but there's that temptation that we, we automatically feel better than they are. So this temptation to use money for significance, right? It's, it's our social standing is a big problem. So that's one on one hand. But on the other hand, there might be another reason why we care so much about money is because we use it for safety and control. These are our savers, right? So those of you who save money, I save money because there's a rainy day coming in. I want to make sure that we're ready for that rainy day. If I have money, I have control in an uncontrollable world. Um, there's, now, here's the thing. Is it wise to save money? Absolutely it is. And I encourage you to. You really should save some money. If you got no money, you should be, well, good luck. <laughs> right? um, but here's, you should save money for emergencies, you should save money for your goals. But listen, we're fooling ourselves to think that money can give us more control over our lives. The instinct to save is the exact same instinct to spend. And that's that, uh, that, that somehow we can gain more control and more favor in our lives. 
And in fact, it gives us more stress. How many of you uh, who are savers, you're like, man, if I don't save enough, right, you don't feel right. You gotta get to that point. You gotta get to that amount that you're saving, putting away enough per month. And Jesus has something to say about that. He says, therefore, verse 25, therefore I tell you, don't worry about your life. Look at this anxiety that you're building in yourselves when you're worried about what you, you know, when you're serving money. Therefore, remember verse 25, therefore, obviously reverse what I just told you. I'm therefore going, don't, you can't serve God in money, therefore, stop worrying. If you, if you realize that, you, that there's these two masters, and money was your master, that's the worrying master, but God is the one that frees you from that worry. So, he says, therefore, um, uh, therefore, stop worrying about this so much. This in instinct to save, you can't, it can't give you any more, uh, any more security in your life than you think it can. Um, isn't life more than food? Isn't body more than clothing? So stop worrying about protecting your life so much with a fatter wallet. The fatter wallet, you know what it cannot do? A fatter wallet cannot pre prevent your death. A fatter wallet cannot prevent tragedy. A, pre a fatter wallet cannot prevent a broken relationship in your life. A fatter wallet can't build you up spiritually. Right? So all these things that we think saving can do or spending can do simply darkens our eyes. We can't see that we have a greed issue. So that's the first thing we learned. And then secondly, we said that, that treasuring, right, significance through lifestyle, treasuring and security through savings and stockpiling, we feel that when, when we're there, that our hearts are there as well. We get totally caught up into it in our hearts. Where your treasure is, there it is your heart as well. So finally, how do we break this cycle? How do we get to the solution around either the saving or the spending? There's a third option. Isn't that beautiful? Look, well, Jesus is like, this is what's natural to us. It's either just natural to spend, natural to save, but let me tell you what's unnatural. But, and, and the solution for us. It's something even better, okay? We escape this trappings of money having power over us by verse 19. Verse 19 says this, but store up for yourselves, right, treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust nor like, destroyers or thieves cannot break in and steal. Um, once again, the Sermon on the Mount, what have, we, what have we been learning about the Sermon on the Mount in general? That it really is, goes deeper. It goes deeper than what feels natural. It's about the heart. It's about the state of our heart. He says, look at the state of your heart. What do you treasure? What do you treasure? Now, what does it mean to treasure something? What does it mean to treasure something? To treasure something, in this definition, means this. It means to look at something and to fill your heart with how beautiful it is and how valuable it is. Now, we all know this because we've all had crushes on somebody at some point in time in our life. And we treasure that was oh my god. She's so beautiful. Right. He's so beautiful. Whatever. We've all had these moments where we treasured something. But we can treasure money. We look at money sometimes and we say, oh, look at it. if I could just add a little more, oh my gosh, my pro my problems would go away. Oh, it would it would give me what I need, right? So it would we 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 have this quote in our head. So long as I have this, so so long as I have this, it'll all be worth it. So long as I just get a little bit of it, if I if I had more, a little more than I currently have, it would all be worth it, and then I would be worth it. You see, if I had a little more, it would be worth it, and I would be worth it. It would, it would a little better family or bigger family. Um, if I had a little more money, if I had the car, or the degree, or the house, or the boyfriend or girlfriend, if I was just eating at restaurants, or that restaurant more often, if I was vacationing more in those hot spots. That's the glimmer that treasure has to our eye. And that glimmer says, if you possess me, I'll give you, I'll fill your needs. But it doesn't happen, you know this. Every time we fill ourselves with something, it's temporary. It leaves us hungry for even more. Uh, and the yearning becomes even stronger. It's short-term 
fulfilling uh, short term but long term leaves us empty. Again, that Lord of the Rings example, right? The Lord of the Rings is about what? It's about a ring. <laughs> right? What ring? It's the ring of. What? I, I forget. What is it? What, what, what ring is it about? Is it the, it's the name of the ring? Is it the ring of power? It's called the ring of power. That's what I want to get. We're going into the war war to destroy the ring of power. And of course, whenever you, somebody possesses it, what do they say? What do they call it? It's the precious. precious. You have to put a bunch of extra S's on the end. Um, it becomes precious. It becomes beautiful to them valuable to them, the ultimate treasure. And what happens, just like with money, is that they will pay any price to get it. They will give anything to get it. It's the only thing in their life that's worth it. The Bible says that every person on this planet has some kind of treasure in this world. Every person on this planet has something that they would die for to get it. They would give everything to get that in order to purchase it. Everything in this world however, will eventually take your life in the pursuit of finding it. It will take life from you, even to the point of taking your life. It takes so much from you. And that's the Lord of the Rings, right? That's the story of Lord of the Rings, of Gollum or Smeagol. It's just like, he's just simply a shell of a man <laughs> at the end that you don't even see what he is anymore. And, and we see that in our, in, uh, in our rich friends sometimes. And do we see it in ourselves? We see that we have become the shell of ourselves because sometimes we've given up to the precious. I love this. The Bible says that every treasure in the world will uh, you will die to purchase it, but Jesus is the one treasure who died to purchase you. It's the opposite, right? In anything you make your supreme value will say, you need to die for me. But Jesus Christ says, I have died for you. When you treasure the creator instead of the creation, this is the key. How do you break this power of money, this power of more? And, you know, it's, it's a slow boil, right? You don't all of a sudden overnight say, oh, I'm, I'm all, I'm, you know, all my money is my master. No, it just, it's like, oh, just a little, just a little more, right? I'm, I'm humble, I'll just get a little bit more. No, you need to break that now while you're young, while you don't have anything, <laughs> right? If you don't start these values even young as young people, you'll, you'll start to understand. And, and the way you do it is that, that that treasure, that's what Jesus says, where your treasure is, so will your heart part all also be. We need to treasure our Creator, our, our the one who loves us. When you say to Jesus, so long as I have you, so long as I have you, it will all be worth it. And I'll be worth it. The freedom from money means changing your treasure. Changing your treasure. It doesn't mean that you all of a sudden treasure nothing. Right? That's what uh, Buddhism says, right? Like nirvana, it's like freedom from any desires or whatever. No, the, ch the freedom is to change the desire from the created to the creator. He's the one that can free you from that. Switching your allegiance from possession to provider. Um, I've been reading a book, uh, so uh, I'm going to stay in Stones for the first time in a bunch of years, and I'm teaching a track and two workshops, and now I want to shoot myself in the foot. Um, but <laughs> my track is called God and Money, so it's like, oh my gosh, how am I going to do this? Um, so part of this is preparation <laughs> for my track. Um, but I, I bought a book called God and Money. I, think it's, I encourage you to, to buy it. It's a, it's a book to buy. Uh, it's a book by two guys who went to Harvard Business School. And at, at the end, uh, or while they were there, they were, they were like, let's read the Bible again. So they did, and through it, they discovered um, that there are um, over 4,000 verses in the Bible about money, and that like they came to seven different conclusions. Well, maybe we'll, we'll highlight that another day. But uh, here's this really, really practical way 
that I'm excited to share with you. Okay? He came up with a 3S framework. A 3S framework about how to understand who you are in your relationship to money. Okay? So they are number one, the spender, number two, the saver, and number three, the servant. Oh gosh, I love this. Are you a spender? Are you a saver? Or are you a servant? So a spender is a person who is all about consumption, all about as much as soon as possible. Uh, the saver strives to limit their consumption. Okay, let's get some self-control here. But and so that we can accumulate the wealth and put it away for that rainy day um, and have as much as possible later. But the servant strives to limit their consumption in order to um, store up their treasure where moth and rust cannot destroy, uh, destroy these break in and steal. And the servant in this case is described as a person who uses as much as they can to bless other people. I don't know that. So here's a quick fun quiz for you to discover if you are a spender, a saver, or a servant. Question number one, ABC, right? Question number one, what excites you know more? A, a four-star vacation to Europe. B, maxing out your retirement funds for the year. Or C, helping as many people as possible go on a mission trip or youth camp or helping your church save as much as possible so one day they can buy a building. <laughs> Okay, let me tell you, so this is from the book, God and Money. The third option was this, taking out your pastor to dinner so you can thank him. And I took that out, just for you. Because some of you do take me out to dinner. Some of you don't, by the way, but some of you do. <laughs> and by the way, you're welcome to come over to my house for Korean barbecue anytime you want and leave all your leftovers. I'm cool with that. Okay, question number two. You hear about a man who at age 70 declares that he has saved $3 million. Your initial reaction is this. A, wow, what a waste. He could have had a lot more fun with that. B, <laughs> wow, he did really well. I hope that I can do that too. C, I bet, out, I bet that he missed out on a lot of opportunities of how, good, how much good he could have done with that money. Three. Okay. Your annual bonus comes in. It's twice the amount that you expected it to be. Um, you say, A, shopping spree, extra vacation days. B, I'm putting this towards my mortgage so I can pay it off faster. C, thank you God, I can't wait to find out how, more, how much more I can give. What's your initial reaction? All right, number four. Spending in life. Spending for in life for you is A, effortless. You have zero problem with spending. B, okay. <laughs> bothersome. Yeah, I, I wish I didn't have to spend so much. C, right, control. I feel good about how much I spend. I have self-control over it. It's balanced and it's godly. How about saving? Let's talk about saving. You are A, bothersome. Wow, this gets, in, this gets in the way of my fun. B, saving is effortless. I love building wealth, no problem. Or C, purposeful. I have healthy reasonable goals. Okay, so if you're taking the quiz, if you're A, <laughs> you're a spender, if you're B, you're a saver, if you're C, and here's the fact, okay, by show of hands, we're all like failing here, right? Who here, after taking the test, said, Okay, I fall on the A. Okay. Who here, by show of hands, say, no, I fall on the B? Who here, by show of hands, say, I fall on the C? I was going to accuse you of being liars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, put your hand down. <laughs> I mean, the truth is 99% of us. We're either spenders, we think, oh, okay, the truth is we're spenders. Or we're really good, we're good beyond that, and we're savers. And very few of us really think of ourselves as servants with their money. Now, here's one more thing I want you to think about with this, and we're almost done. 
What's the difference between the three? What's really the difference between the three? This is awesome. The difference between the three is time. Because the spender invests money on their now. And the saver invests money on their future. And the, the servant invests money for each other. That's the difference. It's time. You see that? I love that. I think that's so awesome. The difference is, is, is this. The difference is what difference your money will make in the future. Will it fulfill short-term desires? Or are you not looking far enough? Because if you're a spender, you're not looking far enough with your money. You don't see its value. You're clouded. You're dark in your eye. Jesus says you have an opportunity to have eternal consequences for your money. <laughs> it's amazing. He says this, right? And he says, but store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy or where thieves don't break in the steel. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. How can we be servants? The only way we can be servants is because Jesus was a servant to us first. You all are Christians, are you not? Followers of Christ. Jesus was a servant to us first. He left complete abundance in heaven, complete glory, all self-sufficiency of heaven, the security of heaven to become one of us. And as one of us, he had the heart for us, for me, not just for my self-preservation or my security or my significance. He had a heart for me to adopt me into his family. And he gave all those those pleasure, the, the greatness of heaven to come and serve you and to serve me. And because he came to come and, to come and serve you and to serve, serve me, he's asking us to be servants. The beautiful, backwards, upside-down kingdom of God. The truth of God's economy. Those who save their lives will lose it, but those who lose their life for my sake will find it, says Jesus. Look at this promise, however, in 33. We're so worried. Oh, I don't know if I can have the servant mentality. It's too hard. It's, it's truly, it's, it's replacing this dependence on money to replacing the dependence on God. Yeah, it is. But it's too hard. What, what if I, I find myself in a place where I'm in need? What if I find my place where I'm in a place where I'm desperate? Well, look at 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be provided for you. Now, the health and wealth churches are going to say, Oh, look, give us your money. Keep bringing us your money. And then God's going to, you know, they say in the big southern girl, God's going to rain down his manna on you. <laughs> I hate those things. <laughs> That's not what it's saying. What it's saying is this. What money can do for you. The significance you're looking for. The security that you're looking for. You know where you're going to find that. You're going to find that by losing your significance to the money, for money. Losing your significance that you get, or safety that you get for money. You will find it again through Christ. Because he can provide for you far greater and more than what money ever will. Isn't that awesome? You're going to find it. That promise is real. It's not going to look like you think, you know, like the health and wealth churches. But you're going to find something that you will be stable and secure in far more than money can, can do. All the significance, all the fulfillment, all the security, all the family, all the love that you are seeking that money cannot give you. If you set those down before the throne of God, that's where you will find it. So this money isn't about scarcity. And this money isn't trying to convince you to give more. If you did give more, I'm not opposed to that. Okay? Uh, by the way, I don't personally benefit from you giving more. <laughs> so that's not what I'm saying yet. Um, that's not how our church works. Um, but we do. So I'm not, this is where, I used to be terrified about talking about money. 
When I first, first was a pastor here, I was terrified. I would not talk about it for years. And then Leo, my mentor, was like, why? You are depriving your church of the blessing of giving if you don't do this. And now I'm totally honest. I'm like, I'm so excited to talk about this. It's, it's like physical, a physical way to see the excitement that, that can happen here. Okay, so this message, in closing, this message is not about scarcity, not about just giving up and being an ascetic and like giving it all up, right? And you need to be more poor and bad you if you're rich. No, it's about that we have an abundance in Christ. We have the security in Him. We have uh, that significance in Him. Uh, it's a, a knowledge that you already have everything you need to fulfill God's plan for you in your life right now. So, when we realize that, we're able to finally come to God and say, God, I'm ready to serve. I'm ready to reject money as my master. It has no more influence on me in my life, in my decisions, and in my direction in life. That's the prayer that I'd like for us to pray as we leave. Can you just stand with me? If you're ready to do this, okay, we're going to pray with our eyes open and literally sit, tell us to God. If you're ready to do this, just repeat after me. Or not repeat, we'll just stand together. One, two, three. God, I'm ready to serve you. I reject money as my master. It has no more influence on my decisions and my direction in life. Amen. All right. God bless you. Um, and have a great week.